Hi, my name is Jocelyn Morton. This is the Iliad, Book 17. In that battle, warlike Menelaus, son of Atreus, noticed that the Trojans had just killed Patroclus. Dressed in gleaming armor, he strode through the ranks of those fighting in the front, then made a stand over the corpse, like a mother beside her calf lowing over her firstborn, with no experience of giving birth till then. In just that way, fair-haired Menelaus stood above Patroclus. In front of him, he held his spear and a round shield, eager to kill anyone who might come at him. But Euphorbus, son of Panthous, with his ash spear, also knew that brave Patroclus had been killed. Moving up close to the dead body, he spoke out, addressing more like Menelaus. Divinely raised Menelaus, son of Atreus, leader of men, go back. Leave this corpse. Abandon these battle trophies. No Trojan and no famous ally hit Patroclus before I struck him with my spear in that murderous fight. So let the Trojans give me the honor and the fame. If not, I'll steal your sweet life with one spear throw. With a great scowl, fair-haired Menelaus then replied, By Father Zeus, such arrogant boasting has no great merit. The spirit in a leopard, lion, or ferocious boar whose chest contains the fiercest and the strongest fury. None of these, it seems, can match the arrogance and sons of Panthous with their lawn ash spears. But not even horse-taming Hyperenor, strong as he was, got much enjoyment from his youthful vigor once he'd mocked me as he waited when I came against him, calling me the most unworthy warrior among Danaeans. I don't think he went home to cheer up his dear wife and worthy parents on his own two feet. So if you stand here against me, I'll drain your strength as well, just as I did his. In fact, I'd advise you to retreat. Get back to your companions. Don't oppose me in case you run into something unwelcome. From experience, there are lessons even fools can learn. Menelaus spoke, but he failed to sway Euphorbus, who replied, Now indeed, divinely raised Menelaus, you'll surely make up for my brother's death, Hyperenor, whom you killed. You speak in triumph about widowing his wife in her new bridal home, bringing sorrow, grief beyond enduring to his parents. I may provide them with a way of easing their sad misery if I bring home your head and armor and toss them into the hands of Panthous and Queen Frontis. In any case, we won't delay our struggle long. Let's start. Fight on, whether for victory or flight. Saying this, Euphorbus struck Menelaus's round shield. But the bronze did not break through. The powerful shield bent back the point. Then Menelaus, Atreus's son, praying to Father Zeus, charged and clutching his spear as Euphorbus was moving back. He struck him at the bottom of his throat, putting his full weight behind the blow with confidence in his strong fists. The spear thud drove straight through Euphorbus's soft neck. He fell with a thud, his armor clanging round him. His hair as lovely as the fine curls on the graces with braids in gold and silver clips, was soaked in blood. Just as a man tends a flourishing olive shoot in some lonely place with a rich source of water, a lovely vigorous sapling stirred with the motion of every breeze, so it bursts out in white blossoms, but then a sudden stormy wind arising rips it from its trench and lays it out prone on the earth. That's how Menelaus, son of Atreus, cut down Panthous's son Euphorbus of the fine ash spear. He then began to strip the armor off. Just as a mountain lion, trusting its own strength, snatches the finest heifer from a grazing herd, seizing her first by the neck in its powerful jaws, then breaks the neck and savagely rips that cow open, gorging itself on its blood, on all the entrails, while around it dogs and herdsmen cry out in distress again and again, but at a distance, unwilling to confront the beast, pale in the grip of fear. In just that way, no Trojan's heart was brave enough to move up and fight against fine Menelaus. Then Atreus' son would have easily carried off the celebrated armor of the son of Panthous if Phoebus Apollo had not been offended. 
he urged Hector, swift Ares' equal, to challenge Menelaus. Taking on the likeness of a man, Mentes, leader of the Chicones, Apollo addressed Hector with these winged words. Hector, now you're going after something you'll not catch, chasing the horses of warrior Achilles, descendant of Aeacus. No mortal man except Achilles can control or drive them, for an immortal mother gave him birth. Meanwhile, warrior Menelaus, Atreus' son standing by Patroclus, has just killed the best man of the Trojans, Euphorbus, son of Panthous, ending his brave fight. With these words, Apollo withdrew again, a god among the toiling men. A bitter cloud of sorrow darkened Hector's heart. Looking through the ranks of men, he quickly noticed Menelaus stripping off the famous armor, with Euphorbus on the ground lying there, blood flowing from his open wound. Armed in his gleaming bronze, Hector marched ahead through those fighting in the front with a piercing shout like the inextinguishable fires of Hephaestus. Hearing that penetrating yell, Atreus' son grew worried. He spoke to his courageous heart. Here's trouble. If I leave this fine armor and Patroclus, who lies here because he tried to avenge my honor, some Danaean seeing this will call me a disgrace. But if I fight Hector and his Trojans all by myself out of a sense of shame, then they'll surround me, many warriors against one man. Hector's gleaming helmet is bringing all the Trojans straight at me. But why is my fond heart debating about this? When a man wants to cross what gods have willed, fighting a man uh, the gods are honoring, then some disaster soon rolls over him. So none of the Danaeans seeing me here moving back from Hector will find that shameful, seeing that Hector fights with God's assistance. But if I could find Ajax, skilled in war shouts, the two of us drawing on our fighting strength might come back, even against God's will, so we could find a way to save this corpse for Achilles' sake, the son of Peleus. In this bad situation, that's what's best. As Menelaus thought these matters over in his mind and heart, the Trojan ranks moved forward with Hector in the lead. Menelaus then backed off, leaving the corpse behind. He kept looking round like a bearded lion which dogs and men chase off. Their spears and shouts drive it from the farm. The beast's heart, though brave, grows cold, moving from that farmyard against its will. That's how fair-haired Menelaus backed off from Patroclus. He turned round, standing firm. Once he reached the company of his companions, he looked for mighty Ajax, son of Telamon, and soon observed him on the left flank of the army, rallying his companions, urging them to fight. For Phoebus Apollo had made them all fall back in an amazing panic. Going off on the run, Menelaus came up to Ajax, then spoke out, Ajax, my friend, come here. Let's hurry over to defend the dead Patroclus. Let's see whether for Achilles' sake, we can at least retrieve the naked corpse. Hector with his bright helmet already has the armor. Menelaus spoke, rousing the heart in warlike Ajax, who moved up among those fighting in the front. With him went fair-haired Menelaus. Once Hector had stripped off the famous armor from Patroclus, he then tried to drag away the body so with his sharp bronze he could hack Patroclus's head from off its shoulders, then pull back the corpse to give to Trojan dogs. But Ajax moved in close with his shield up like a wall. So Hector gave ground, withdrawing to the company of his companions, then jumped up to his chariot. He gave the splendid armor to some Trojans to carry to the city, something that would bring him special glory. Ajax then covered Menetius' son with his broad shield and made his stand there like a lion over its cubs, a beast which hunters run across in the forest as it leads its young or long. The lion shows off its power and contracts its brows into fine slits which conceal its eyes. That's how Ajax defended warrior Patroclus. With him there on the other side stood war-loving Menelaus, son of Atreus, heart filled with utmost sorrow. Then Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, commander of the Lycians, looking at Hector with a frown, criticized him harshly. Hector, to look at you, you're the finest man we've got, but in battle you're sadly lacking. The fame you have as a courageous warrior is misplaced. You're a man who runs away. 
Consider now, how are you going to save your city only with those soldiers born in Ilion? For no Lycian will set out to fight against Denians for your city's sake, since there's apparently no gratitude for taking on our enemies without a rest. How can you rescue a lesser warrior from the thick of battle, ungrateful man, when Sarpedon, once your companion, your guest, you abandoned to the Argives to become their battle spoils, their trophy? He often served you well, both your city and you personally, while he was alive. But now you lack the courage to protect him from the dogs. So now, if any Lycian man will listen to me, we'll go home, and Troy will witness its utter devastation. If Trojans could now fill themselves with courage, a resolute and dauntless spirit, the sort of men the sort men have when they defend their native land, struggling hard against a hostile army, then we'd haul Patroclus back to Ilion at once. If we pulled him from the battle and brought the corpse to Priam's mighty city, our guys would quickly trade the lovely armor belonging to Sarpedon, and we could then take his body back to Troy. Their dead men attended on the greatest of the Argives, who leads the best spear fighters by their ships. But you don't dare stand up to Ajax in the thick of battle, look that brave warrior in the eye, or confront him one-on-one, -on -one, since he's a better man than you. Hector of the gleaming helmet, looking angry, then replied, Glaucus, why would a man like you speak out so arrogantly? My friend, I thought you had a better mind than any other man living in fertile Lycia. But now, on the basis of what you've just said, I find your thinking questionable. You say I didn't stand to fight great Ajax. I'm not afraid of war, the din of chariots. But there's always something more powerful, the mind of Zeus, who bears the Aegis. Zeus makes even brave men run away, stealing their victory with ease, or in person, rouses men to fight. But come, my friend, stand here beside me. Look at what I do, whether I'm a coward all day long, as you allege, or whether I prevent Danaeans for their fighting frenzy from defending dead Patroclus. Hector spoke, then with a great shout, he called out to his Trojans. Trojans, Lycians, Dardan spearmen, be men, my friends. Recall your battle fury until I can put on the lovely armor of great Achilles, which I stripped off the great Patroclus once I'd killed him. With these words, Hector of the Shining Helmet left that furious conflict and strode quickly off with rapid strides, following his companions, the men taking of the famous armor of Achilles towards the city. He caught them a short distance off. Then, standing apart from that dreadful fight, he changed his armor. He gave his own equipment to war-loving Trojans to carry to the city of sacred Ilion, then put on the immortal armor of Achilles, son of Peleus, which heavenly gods had given to Achilles' well-loved father. Once he'd grown old, Peleus gave it to his son, who, for all his father's armor, did not reach old age. From far away, Cloud gatherer Zeus gazed down on Hector as he dressed himself in the battle armor of Peleus' godlike son. Shaking his head, Zeus then spoke to his own heart. You poor wretch, you're not considering your own death at all. It's getting closer. So you're putting on the immortal armor of the finest man who makes other men afraid. You've just killed his comrade a kind, courageous man, and then vainly stripped the armor off his head and shoulders. But for the moment, I'll give you great power to compensate you, since you'll not be coming back from battle or handing over to Andromache the glorious armor of the son of Peleus. The son of Cronus spoke, then nodded his dark brow. He changed the armor so it suited Hector's body. Then the fearful war god Ares entered Hector, filling his limbs with strength and courage. He set off to the tremendous shouts of all his famous allies as he paraded there in front of them, dazzling them all with the armor of the great-hearted son of Peleus. Hector moved around with words of encouragement to everyone. Mechles, Glaucus, Madon, Thersilochus, Asteropeus, Desenor, Hippothous, Phorsus, Coraeus and Enemus, who read omens found in birds. 
Hector urged them on. His words had wings. Listen to me, you countless tribes of allies, you neighbors. I called you here, each from your own city, not because I wished a large display or needed it, but so you might help me rescue Trojan wives and little children from warrior Achaeans. With this in mind, I squander the resources of my people with food supplies and presents to strengthen hearts in each of you. Now let everyone turn around and face the enemy directly, whether to survive or die, for in that choice we find the joy which we derive from war. Patroclus is dead, but whoever pulls him to horse-taming Trojans here and makes Ajax move away, I'll give him half the spoils, keeping the other half myself, and he'll get a share of the glory equal to my own. Hector finished. Trojans then threw their full weight straight at the dead ends, holding spears up high, their hearts hoping they would drag that body away from Ajax, son of Telamon. What fools! By that corpse, Ajax took many of their lives. Then Ajax sent to, Mea, then Ajax sent to Mea, Menelaus, skilled at war shouts. Divinely reared Menelaus, my friend. I don't expect we two will be returning from this battle. I'm not concerned so much about Patroclus's corpse, which soon enough will be food for Trojan dogs and birds, but I fear for my own head and yours as well, which may be in danger. Hector's become a war cloud which envelops everything and our complete destruction's plain to see. So come, call out to Achaea's finest men. One of them may hear. Ajax finished. Menelaus, skilled at war shouts, followed his advice. He shouted to the Danaeans with a piercing yell. Friends, rulers and leaders of Achaeans, all you who drink your wine at public cost with Agamemnon and Menelaus, sons of Atreus, all you who rule your people to whom Zeus has given honor and glory, it's difficult for me to see precisely what each of you is doing. This conflict rages on so fiercely. But all of you must come here, even if not called by name, for you'll feel shame and anger in your hearts if Patroclus should become a toy for Tro Trojan dogs to play with. Menelaus stopped. Swift Ajax, son of Oelius, heard him clearly. He was the first to come running through the battle to meet Menelaus. After him came others, Idomeneus and his companion, Meriones, the man-killing war god's equal, and others too. But what man has a mind which could name all these who came up behind these warriors in that conflict to reinforce Achaeans? Trojans then drove forward in a single group with Hector leading them, just as a huge wave roars into a flowing stream at the mouth of a river fed from heaven with headlands on both sides of the shoreline echoing the boom of saltwater surf beyond. That's how Trojans roared as they came on and attack. Achaeans held firm around Menetius' son, united by a common spirit behind a fence of their bronze shields. The son of Cronus cast a thick mist down on their glittering helmets, for Zeus had not felt hostile to Patroclus in earlier days when he was alive and comrade to Achilles. So Zeus did not want Patroclus to become merely a plaything for the dogs of his Trojan enemies. Thus, he encouraged Patroclus' companions to defend him here, at first, the Trojans drove bright-eyed Achaeans back, so they retreated from the body, leaving it behind. But the Trojans, though confident with their long spears, did not kill anyone for all their eagerness. Still, they did begin to drag away the body. But the Achaean pullback was only temporary, for Ajax quickly rallied them. Of all Danians, he was the finest in his looks and actions after the son of Peleus. Ajax strode around through those fighting in the front, like a mountain boar who scatters dogs and strong young men with ease as it wheels through forest clearings. That's how Ajax, splendid son of noble Telamon, easily pushed back the Trojan ranks as he moved among them. They stood there over Patroclus, wanting desperately to haul him off back to their city and win glory for themselves. Then Hippothous, noble son of Pelasgian Lithous, began to drag the body by the feet through the crowd. He tied his shield strap round both ankle tendons, eager to please Hector and the Trojans. But right away, 
He faced a danger which no one could avert, no matter how much he might want to. For Ajax, moving quickly through the throng, struck him at close range on the bronze cheek piece of his helmet. The spear point smashed through the helmet with its horsehair crest, driven by the force of Ajax's mighty fists in that huge spear. Blood and brains gushed from the wound and oozed together along the socket of the spear. The strength drained out of him where he was standing. Hippothous let go the feet of brave Patroclus, allowing them to fall and lie there. Then he collapsed, falling face down on the body, far away from rich Larissa. He did not repay his parents for the work they'd done to rear him. He did not live long enough, slaughtered on the spear of great-hearted Ajax. Hector then threw his shining spear at Ajax, but he was directly facing Hector, so he saw it coming. Ajax dodged the weapon, but only just. It hit Scedius, by far the best of men from Phocis, son of great-hearted Iphitus, who lived at home in celebrated Panopius, ruling many men. Hector's spear struck this man right on the collarbone. The bronze point drove on through and came out by his shoulder. He fell with a crash, his armor rattling round him. Then Ajax struck, hitting warlike forces, Phenops' son, in the gut as he stood over Hippothous. Breaking the plate on body armor, the bronze sliced out his innards. Forces fell in the dust, fingers clawing at the earth. At that point, glorious Hector and his foremost men drew back. With a tremendous shout, Argives dragged off the bodies of the dead Hippothous and Forces. They began to strip the armor from their shoulders. Right then, war-loving Achaeans would have driven Trojans back to Ilion, conquered by their own cowardice, with Argives winning glory beyond what Zeus decreed through their own strong power. But Apollo himself stirred up Aeneas, taking on the form of Periphas, the herald, son of Epitos, who had grown old serving as herald to, as herald to Aeneas's old father. He was wise and well-disposed towards Aeneas, in this man's form, Apollo, son of Zeus, spoke up. Aeneas, can you not defend steep Ilion in defiance of some god? I have seen other men who trusted their strong power and courage, and with their numbers held their country against Zeus's will. But Zeus wants us to win far more than the Danaeans, and you all suffer countless fears and won't keep battling on. He finished. Aeneas recognized Apollo, the far shooter, once he looked into his face. Aeneas then shouted out, addressing Hector, Hector and the rest of you commanders, both Trojans and allies, it would be shameful if war-loving Achaeans drive us back all the way to Ilion, if we're beaten by our cowardice. Some gods just told me, he came and stood beside me, that even now in this fight, High Counselor Zeus is helping us. So let's go straight at this let's go straight at these Danians and not let them carry dead Patroclus back to their ships without a battle. Aeneas finished. He strode far ahead of all the fighters at the front, then stood there. Trojans rallied round and made a stand facing the Achaeans. With his spear, Aeneas then struck up down Leocritus, son of Arisbus, the courageous companion of Lycomedes. As he fell, war loving Lycomedes pitied him. He moved in close, stood there, and threw his shining spear. It hit Apiseon, a son of Hippasus, shepherd of his people, below his abdomen, right in the liver. Apiseon's limbs collapsed. He'd come from fertile Paeonia, their best man in a fight after Asteropaeus, and his fall filled warrior Asteropaeus with sorrow. He charged ahead, ready to fight Danians. But that was now impossible for they stood there in a group around Patroclus, holding up their shields on every side with their spears extending outward. Ajax moved around among them all, giving orders, telling them that no man should move back from the corpse or stride out to fight in front of massed Achaeans. They must all stand firm around the body, fighting hand to hand. That's what mighty Ajax ordered. Dark blood soaked the earth. The pile of dead bodies grew as they fell. Trojans, proud allies, Danians too, 
altogether. For as Danians fought, they shed their own blood also. But far fewer of them died, for they were careful to protect each other from complete destruction in that fighting crowd. So they fought on like blazing fire. You could not tell whether sun or moon still shone, for in that fight a mist surrounded all the best men standing there beside Venetius' dead son. Meanwhile, other Trojans fought other well-armed Achaeans undisturbed, under a clear sky, bright sunshine all around them. No clouds above the entire earth or on the mountains. So they fought more casually, keeping their distance, staying out of range of each other's painful weapons. But soldiers in the center were suffering badly in the fog and fighting. The pitiless bronze was wearing down the finest men. But two warriors, Thrasymedes and Antilochus, well-known men had not yet learned about the death of Patroclus. They thought he was still alive fighting the Trojans in the front ranks of the throng. These two were fighting some distance off, watching their companions, keeping track of who was killed or fleeing back as Nestor had instructed when he had urged them into battle by their black ships. Throughout that entire day, the great combat raged, a bitter conflict. The men kept toiling on without a pause, sweat dripping down on their knees and legs, under their feet, and running down men's eyes and hands as both sides battled over swift-footed Achilles' brave companion. Just as a man gives his people a huge bull's hide to stretch after soaking it in fat, and they stand once they've picked it up, and a circle pulling hard so the moisture quickly leaves the hide as the fat soaks in under the tension of so many hands, stretching the entire skin as far as it will go. That's how these men on both sides pulled at the corpse back and forth in a narrow space, hearts full of hope. Trojans seeking to drag it back to Ilion, Achaeans to their hollow ships. Around Patroclus, the conflict grew intense. Neither Ares nor Athena, who incite warriors to battle, if they'd seen that fight, would have disparaged it, not even if they'd been intensely angry. That's how destructive Zeus made the conflict for men and horses that day men fought over Patroclus. Godlike Achilles, at this time, knew nothing of Patroclus's death for they were fighting under the walls of Troy, away from the fast ships. He never imagined in his heart that Patroclus was dead. He thought he was alive and would return once he reached the gates. He did not think he would lay waste the city with him or without him, for often Achilles had learned this from his mother, listening to her in private, when she told him what great Zeus had planned. But at that time, Thetis said nothing of the evil which had taken place the death of his companion, his dearest friend by far. But those beside the corpse kept holding their sharp spears with no pause in the fighting. The mutual slaughter continued on. Bronze-armed Achaeans talked together using words like these. My friends, there'd be no glory for us if we went back to the hollow ships to let the black earth open here for each of us. That would be better for us all by far than if we leave this corpse for horse-taming Trojans to carry off back to their city, winning glory. Great-hearted Trojans, too, spoke words like these. Friends, 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 if we're all fated to be killed together by this man, let no one leave the battle. Men talked like this to strengthen their companions. Then they fought on the smash of iron rising up through the bronze sky. But the horses of Achilles, descendant of Aeacus, stood some distance from the fight, weeping from the time they first learned their charioteer had fallen in the dust at the hands of Hector, killer of men. Automedon, brave son of Diores, often lashed them with a stroke of his quick whip and often spoke to them with soothing words or threats but the two weren't willing to withdraw back to the ships by the broad Hellespont or go towards Achaeans locked in battle. They stayed beside their ornate chariot, immobile, like a pillar standing on the tomb of some dead man or woman, heads bowed down to the earth. Warm tears flowed from their eyes onto the ground as they cried, longing for their driver. Their thick manes covered in dirt trailed down from below their harnesses on both sides of the yoke. Looking at those horses as they mourned, the son of Kronos pitied them. Shaking his head, Zeus spoke to his own heart. 
Poor horses. Why did we give you to King Peleus, a mortal man, for you're a mortal, ageless? Was it so you'd experience sorrow among unhappy men? For the truth is this, of all the things which breathe or move on earth, nothing is more miserable than man. But at least Hector, Priam's son, won't mount you or drive your finely decorated chariot. That I won't permit. Is it not enough he wears his armor and then brags about it? I'll put strength into your legs and hearts so you can carry Automedon safely from this battle back to the hollow ships. For I'll still grant glory to the Trojans to keep on killing till they reach the ships at sunset when sacred darkness comes. <clears throat> Saying this, Zeus breathed great strength into those horses. The two shook out their manes so the dirt fell on the ground. They then set off towards the Trojans and Achaeans, quickly pulling the fast chariot along with them. Behind them, Automedon joined the fighting, though still grieving for his comrade, swooping down in that chariot like a vulture on a flock of geese. He easily escaped the Trojan battle noise, and then with ease charged into the large crowd once more. But in these attacks, he did not kill anyone as he rushed to chase men down. It was impossible, for in the sacred chariot, he was by himself. He could not wield a spear and manage those swift horses. But at last, one of his companions noticed him, Alcimedon, son of La Laerces, Heman's son. Standing behind the chariot, he cried to Automedon, Automedon, what god put inside your chest this useless plan, stealing your common sense? You're fighting against the Trojans by yourself in the front ranks of the crowd. Your comrade has been killed, and on his shoulders, Hector is now wearing the armor of Achilles. He celebrates his glorious triumph. Automedon, son of Diores, replied, Alcimedon, what Achaean warrior is better able to control and guide these strong immortal horses than yourself, except Patroclus, a man as wise as gods while he was alive? Now he's met his death his fate. So take the shining reins and whip. I'll get down from the chariot and fight. Automedon spoke. Then Alcimedon, springing up into that fast chariot, quickly grabbed the reins and whip. Automedon leaped out. Seeing this, glorious Hector at once spoke to Aeneas, who was close by. Aeneas, counselor to bronze-armed Trojans, I see the two horse team of swift Achilles coming to this fighting with poor charioteers. That pair I'd like to capture, if your heart is willing, since those men lack the courage to confront the two of us, if we attack or to stand and fight against us both. Hector spoke. And he as his strong son was not unwilling. So the two moved straight ahead, guarding their shoulders under bull's hide shields, tanned and tough, with thick bronze hammered out on top. With them went Chromius and godlike Eretus, fully hoping in their hearts to kill the, kill the men, then drive those strong-necked horses off. What fools! They would not return from Automedon without shedding their own blood. Then Automedon prayed to Father Zeus, and his dark heart was filled with strength and courage. Immediately he spoke out to Asimedon, his loyal companion. Asimedon, make sure you keep the horses close to me so they breathe right on my neck. I don't think Hector, son of Priam, will check his fury until he's killed the pair of us and climbed behind the fine manes of these horses belonging to Achilles, then driven in flight the Argive ranks, or himself been slaughtered among the front-line fighters. Automedon finished, then shouted to both Ajaxes and Menelaus, You Ajaxes, both Argive leaders, Menelaus, leave that corpse to the rest of our best men who will stand firm around it. Protect the two of us from ruthless fate while we're still living. For Hector and Aeneas, Troy's best men in this harsh fight, are coming hard against us. But these things lie in the lap of the gods, so I'll attempt to throw. Whatever happens, it's all up to Zeus. Saying this, Automedon hefted his long-shadowed spear and threw it, hitting the round shield of Aretas, which did not stop it. The bronze went straight on through, severed his belt, then drove low in his stomach. Just as a strong man with a sharp axe strikes a farm ox right behind its horns, slicing clean through sinews, so the ox stumbles forward and falls down. That's how Aretus jerked forward and then fell onto his back. Once that sharp spear impaled itself, quivering in his organs, 
his limbs gave way. Then Hector threw his bright spear at Automedon, but since he was directly facing Hector, he saw the bronze spear coming and evaded it by leaning forward. The lawn spear stuck in the ground behind him, its shaft trembling until great Ares stilled its force. Now they would have charged each other and fought hand to hand with swords, but the Ajaxes made them move apart for all their battle fury. They came through the crowd answering their comrades' shout. Hector, Aeneas, and godlike Chromius, afraid of both Ajaxes, moved back once again, leaving Aretas lying there with a mortal wound. Automedon, swift Ares' equal, stripped the armor, boasting in triumph. I've managed here to ease somewhat my heart's grief for the death of Menetius' son, though the man I've killed is a lesser man than he. With these words, he took the blood-stained spoils and put them in the chariot. Then he got in, feet and upper arms all bloody, like a lion that's just gorged itself on cattle. Then once more, over Patroclus, the bitter fight resumed, fierce and full of sorrow. Athena, stirred up by the conflict, coming down from heaven, sent by wide scenes used to urge on the Danaeans, for his mind had changed. Just as for mortal men, Zeus bends his colored rainbow down from heaven, an omen prophesying war or some harsh storm, upsetting flocks and stopping men from work upon the earth. That's how Athena then placed herself in the Achaean throng, wrapped in a purple mist. She stirred up all the men, giving encouragement first to courageous Menelaus, son of Atreus, who was close by her. Taking the form of Phoenix, in his untiring voice, she said, Surely, Menelaus, you'll be disgraced, have to hang your head in shame if Achilles' fine and loyal companion is ravaged by swift dogs beneath Troy's walls. So be brave, stand firm, encourage all your men. Menelaus, expert in war shouts, answered her, Old Phoenix, you venerable old man, if only Athena would give me strength, defend me from the shower of weapons, I'd be happy to stand above Patroclus, protecting him. His death has touched my heart, but Hector has the power of deadly fire. He won't stop cutting men down with his bronze, for Zeus is giving him the glory. Menelaus's words pleased the bright-eyed goddess Athena, for he first prayed to her of all the gods. She put strength in his shoulders and his knees. Then in his chest, she set the persistence of a gnat, which no matter how much one brushes it away from someone's skin keeps on biting, it finds human blood so sweet. With that stamina, she filled up his dark heart. Standing over Patroclus, he hurled his shining spear. Among the Trojans was a rich, brave man called Podes, son of Iation whom Hector granted special honor among men as his companion, his good friend at a feast. Fair-haired Menelaus struck him with his spear as he began to flee. He hit him on the belt. The bronze drove straight on through. Podes fell with a thud. Then Menelaus, Atreus' son, dragged the corpse away from Trojans into the crowd of his companions. At that point, Apollo came up close to Hector to reinforce his spirit. He took the form of Phenops, son of Aseus, of all Hector's guests, the one he liked the most. Phenops lived at home in Abydos. In his shape, Apollo, son of Zeus, spoke out, Hector, which of the Achaeans will now fear you since you're afraid of Menelaus, who so far has been a feeble spearman? But all by himself, he snatched a body from the Trojans and gone off with it. He's killed your trusty comrade Podes, Eation's son, a noble frontline warrior. As he spoke, black clouds of grief enveloped Hector. He strode by the foremost fighters, armed in gleaming bronze. Then the son of Kronos took his tasseled aegis, all glittering, hid Ida behind clouds, then flashed his lightning with tr a tremendous peal of thunder as he shook the aegis, awarding victory to Trojans and making Achaeans run away. The first to begin the rout was Penelaus, a Boeotian. Standing there facing the enemy as usual, he was hit in the shoulder by a spear from Polydamas, who'd come in close to throw. It was a glancing blow, but the point of the spear sliced quite near the bone. Then at close quarters, Hector attacked Leitus, son of great-hearted Electrion. Hector sliced his wrist, and so his fighting ended. Looking around him anxiously, Leitus drew back. He knew that if he could not grip his spear, he had no hope of fighting Trojans. As Hector went at Leitus, Idomeneus 
through and struck his body armor on the chest, right beside the nipple. But the long spear broke at the socket. The Trojans gave a shout. Then Hector threw a spear at Idomeneus, Duke Calion's son. He missed him, but not by much. He did hit Ceranus, Meriones' companion, his charioteer, who had followed him from well-built Lyctus. Idomeneus had come from curving ships that day on foot and would have given the Trojans a great triumph if Ceranus hadn't quickly driven up with his swift-footed horses. For Idomeneus, he came as a saving light, protecting him from ruthless fate. But the act cost him his life at the hands of man-killing Hector, who struck him underneath his jaw and ear. The spear smashed his teeth, roots and all, splitting his tongue in half. Cyrenus tumbled from the chariot. The reins fell on the ground. Meriones stooped down and scooped them from the plain with his own hands, then spoke to Idomeneus. Now lash these horses on until you reach our swift ships, for you recognize yourself that Achaeans will not win this victory. Meriones finished, and so Idomeneus whipped the fair-maned horses back on the hollow ships, for by now fear had fallen on his heart as well. Great-hearted Ajax and Menelaus also knew that Zeus had turned the tide of the battle now, giving victory to the Trojans. The first one to speak was Telamonian Ajax. Here's a problem. Even a fool can see that Father Zeus is now personally helping Trojans. All their flying weapons hit a target, whether a brave man throws them or a coward. Zeus makes them all fly straight. In our case, all our throws lie wasted on the ground. But come, let's sort out the best course of action so we can both drag the corpse and then get back in person to bring joy to our companions. They must be anxious as they watch us here, thinking we can't check the fighting frenzy of man-killing Hector for his all-conquering hands, and we'll withdraw to our black ships. I wish some comrade would report back quickly to Peleus' son, for I don't think he's learned the dreadful news of his dear comrade's death. But I can't see any Argive who would do that. Men and horses are all shrouded in this mist. Father Zeus, rescue these Achaean sons from this fog. Make the sky clear. Let us see with our own eyes. Since it gives you pleasure, kill us, but do in the light of day. As he finished, Ajax wept. Father Zeus pitied him. At once he dispersed the mist, scattering the haze. The sun showed down and all the fight came into view. Then Ajax spoke to Menelaus, skilled at war shouts. Look now, divinely raised Menelaus. See if you can spot Antilochus alive, son of great-hearted Nestor. Get him to go with speed to rouse up fiery Achilles by telling him his companion, the man he loves the most by far, has just been killed. Ajax spoke. Menelaus, expert at war shouts, agreed. He went off like some lion moving from a farm, exhausted by his attacks on dogs and men who prevented tearing flesh out of some cow keeping their watch all night. But ravenous for meat, the beast keeps charging in without success, for spears rain down, thrown by keen hands, then burning sticks, which, for all his fierce desire, make him afraid, so he slinks away at dawn in disappointment. That's how Menelaus, skilled at war cries, left Patroclus much against his will. He feared Achaeans might be pushed back in painful flight, leaving the corpse a trophy for the enemy. He issued many orders to Meriones, to the Ajaxes as well. You two Ajaxes, Argive leaders, and you, Meriones, let each man bear in mind the kindnesses of poor Patroclus, who, when he was alive, knew how to treat every man with care. Now fatal death has overtaken him. With these words, fair-haired Menelaus went away, glancing warily in all directions like an eagle, which men say has the sharpest sight of all the animals flying in the sky, a bird which, while soaring high, doesn't miss the swiftly running hare crouched down under a leafy bush and then sweeping low, seizes it at once and then tears out its life. That's how, Menelaus, raised by gods, your bright eyes kept searching all around through groups of many comrades, seeking Nestor's son to see if he was still alive. Then Menelaus, quickly seeing him on the left flank of the battle, encouraging his companions, urging them to fight, came up to him. Then fair-haired Menelaus said, Divinely raised Antilochus, come here so you can learn the painful news. 
something I wish had never happened. You already know, I think, for your own eyes can see it, how some god is rolling this disaster over the Danaeans, giving victory to the Trojans. The best Achaean, Patroclus, has been slaughtered, a huge loss for the Danaeans, who miss him badly. You must run quickly to the Achaean ships to tell Achilles, so he can bring the corpse in safety to his ship, the naked body, for now Hector of the gleaming helmet wears his armor. Menelaus finished speaking. Hearing that news, Antilochus was overwhelmed. For a long time, he stood in shock, speechless. His eyes filled up with tears. His strong voice failed. But even so, he did not neglect what Menelaus told him. Giving his armor to his noble comrade, Laodocus, who drove the horses close beside him, he set off on the run. As he wept, his swift feet took him from the battle, burying the bad news to Achilles, son of Peleus. And then your heart, divinely raised Menelaus, had no desire to help defend the hard-pressed comrades left there by Antilochus, son of Pylus, who felt his loss severely. But to assist them, Menelaus sent godlike Thrasymedes. Then he went in person to stand by warrior Patroclus. Running over, he took up a position by both Ajaxes and said, I have sent Antilochus to our fast ships to swift Achilles. Still, I don't expect he'll come out now, no matter how enraged he is with God like Hector. He can't fight at all against the Trojans without armor. But now we should consider for ourselves the best thing we should do, so we'll be able to haul off this corpse and leave this Trojan tumult, escaping our own death and our destruction. Great Telamonian Ajax then answered him, Glorious Menelaus, everything you say is true enough. So you and Meriones stoop down and lift the body quickly, as fast as possible. Take it from this fight. We'll hold off the Trojans and godlike Hector, standing behind you with a single heart, just as we share one name. We stood firm before, holding our positions by each other in the face of Ares, the great god of war. Ajax spoke. Then they raised the body off the ground, lifting it high with one great heave. Behind them, Trojan war- soldiers gave a shout as they saw Achaeans hoisting up the corpse. They went after them like hounds, charging ahead of youthful hunters as they chased some wounded wild boar, keen to rip it into pieces. But once it wheels around on them, sure of its strength, they run back in fear, scattering in all directions. That's how groups of Trojans kept following them a while, thrusting at them with swords and double-bladed spears. But when both Ajaxes turned around to stand against them, their color changed, and no one dared rush forward to battle for the dead. So these men worked hard to bring that body from the battle to the hollow ships in the face of a fierce conflict, like some fire suddenly rushing at a city full of people setting it alight, so houses fall among the flames as winds whip the inferno on. That's how the din of chariots and spearmen coming up against them kept resounding as they moved along. But like mules throwing their great strength into their work as they haul a beam or huge ship timber on an uneven path down from the mountains, hearts worn out with the strain as they work on covered in sweat. That's how these men strove hard to carry off the corpse. Behind them, both Ajaxes held off the enemy. Just as a wooded ridge which cuts across a plain holds back a flood, even the strong flow of some harsh rivers pushing their waters back to go across the plain, for the strength of their current cannot rupture it. That's how both Ajaxes held back the Trojans then in that fight. But Trojans kept up their pursuit, especially two of them, Aeneas, Anchises' son, and glorious Hector. Just as a flock of daws or starlings flies off in screaming fear once they see a falcon as it comes after them, bringing death to all small birds. That's how the young Achaean soldiers ran off then, away from Hector and Aeneas, screaming in panic, forgetting all their fierce desire for battle. As Danaeans fled, plenty of fine weapons fell around the ditch, but there was no let up in the war. Thank you guys for listening.